This week on Christian World News, Russia is named a top violator of religious freedom. We'll tell you about the law that's cracking down on evangelicals and talk with one of its victims. Plus, fired up for Jesus. For two straight days, these Christians went without sleep in a marathon session of worshiping, praying, and singing to God. And forgotten genocide. More than 100 years ago, an entire population, including many Christians, was wiped out. A new movie is telling their story for the very first time. And hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. My colleague Wendy Griffith is out on assignment. A surprising move against the nation of Russia this week. A commission said the U.S. State Department should designate Russia, get this, one of the world's top violators of religious freedom. The countries already on that list, by the way, include North Korea, Iran and China, all notorious for their religious freedom abuses. Russia has been cracking down on religious minorities, which is just about any group outside the Orthodox Church. It all stems from a law that was supposedly aimed at religious extremists. On July 20th, 2016, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed new amendments to a law that govern religious life. Under the guise of confronting terrorism, Putin gave authorities the power to ban preaching, praying, proselytizing, and handing out religious materials outside government-sanctioned churches. The U.S. State Department warned the move signaled a troubling Russian trend of intimidation and harassment. Sergei Rakuba's organization works in Russia and in 13 other countries of the former Soviet Union. This law is known among evangelical Christians in Russia as an anti-missionary law because it places harsh restrictions on evangelical churches and foreign missionary organizations. Among other things, the law required foreign missionaries to have a permit to evangelize. Also, reading your Bible, singing, or simply praying outside a registered church, even in a home, became illegal. Roman Lankin is a lawyer with the Slavic Center for Law and Justice. The law inflicted serious damage because suddenly many Christians feared that just talking about faith or sharing with others about God was a crime. Andrea Desnetsky is a prominent Russian commentator. So basically the law tells us not to do anything that can be called a missionary activity, including saying, I believe in Jesus, for instance. Supporters say the law is necessary to confront terrorism, especially acts perpetrated by radical Muslims. But Rakuba insists there's a more sinister agenda. The Russian authorities are trying to restrict the Protestant and evangelical movements and stop them from spreading their influence and the message of the gospel. But there's one group that's been left alone. The law is unlikely to affect the Orthodox Church which some 70% of Russians say they belong to. For the moment, never, never, never. Because now the Russian Orthodox Church is closely associated with the state. Dysnetsky, who is Russian Orthodox, says there are growing numbers within his church that see all non-Orthodox Christians as cults or foreign spies. And he's not happy about it. For some Protestants are, if not enemies, then potential danger. So they need uh, to the opinion some containing. Actually, the word orthodox in Russian, pravoslavny, uh, means the proper way to glorify God, which implies that every other way is improper. The Russian Orthodox Church has a powerful ally in Vladimir Putin. The president has elevated the church's prominence and influence in recent years. In fact, in some corners of Russian society, the Orthodox Church is considered the national church. And this idea is being propagated by mass media, society, and unfortunately by the Orthodox Church and the government. For many religious minorities, this is a fight for all non-Orthodox faiths to have the right to practice their beliefs freely in Russia. In August 2016, American Don Orsawadi was charged and found guilty of conducting missionary activity in Russia. 
Pastor Osawadi joins us via Skype from Oriol, Russia. Don, after 14 years of living in Russia, you just bought a one-way plane ticket home. How do you feel? Uh, this has got to be a difficult decision, right? Yes, sir. It's a it's an it's an end to what I've spent the last 22 years of my life preparing for and participating in ministry in Russia following the fall of the Soviet Union, and uh, of course I'm disappointed that it turned out this way. Um, the the people that we formed a uh, um, a little family of faith here have lost something very valuable to them, and I'm always going to leave a piece of my heart here in Russia. Russia recently decla declared uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses an extremist organization and banned them from operating in the country. What will stop authorities from going after other groups, such as Baptists or Pentecostals? You're right about that. In my opinion, it's just the first step, because as far as they're concerned, a, a Baptist or a Pentecostal is pretty much the way they look at it, the same thing as a Jehovah's Witness. And if the Jehovah's Witnesses don't have uh, their freedom, then I don't see how any of us do. What kind of Russia are you leaving behind? I'm leaving behind a very different Russia than, than I came to 14 years ago. Uh, there was virtually unlimited religious freedom here 14 years ago when I came. Uh, it was very refreshing to, to have that atmosphere and that environment after 70 years of communism. But now you have a Russia that is becoming much more oppressive, much more controlling, um, and much less free. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom says Russia is one of the world's worst violators of religious freedom. In fact, they've asked the State Department to label Russia as a country of particular concern. Uh, do you agree with their assessment? I absolutely agree that uh, Russia is heading in a very wrong direction when it comes to religious freedom. And I would say, yes, it is a, uh, a special concern uh, as we look at religious freedom around the world. How can we pray for Christians in Russia? Pray that they will have wisdom. Pray that they will have boldness. Pray that uh, the Lord will cause the local officials to, to not aggressively prosecute the believers and pray that the believers will, will stand strong and will not give up on practicing their faith just because it's, uh, it's become more difficult. We wish you the best. Don Arsawadi joining us from Oriol, Russia. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, George. If you want to learn more about the church in Russia and the former Soviet Union, you can see our exclusive reports at our CWN page at cbnnews.com. While you're there, share them with your friends and family on Facebook. Okay, moving on. Pope Francis is urging Muslims and their leaders to reject violence in God's name and embrace peace, dialogue, and reconciliation. The Roman Catholic Pope met with Egypt's President al-Sisi during an historic two-day visit to Cairo. He also spoke at a world-renowned Muslim University of Higher Learning. Egyptian Christians said the Pope's visit brought them encouragement just days after two churches were attacked on Palm Sunday. Armenians are a Christian people with a long history in the Middle East. Some don't know that. A little more than 100 years ago, they were victims of one of the worst atrocities in history. Well, now that forgotten episode is the backdrop for an inspirational story in movie theaters. Ephraim Graham sat down with the stars for this look at The Promise. I have to go. Mikhail. I have to find them. Mikhail, leave these people alone. You're safe in the woods. No, no, I'm not safe. No one here is safe. Don't you see what's happening? We've lived through these Turkish threats before. Th threats? They want us dead. I have to get us out of here before there's no time left. Trust me. It's all right. I'm getting us out of here. In The Promise, Oscar Isaac plays an Arminian desperate to save his family from being rounded up and killed. Come with me. Mikhail, Anna. what a pleasant surprise. C Chris, Mikhail is the, is the nephew of Mr. Bogosian. Uh, Christopher Myers. Hey. Nice to meet you. The legendary Chris Myers. Emory Ogan, notorious playboy, frequents 
opium dens, how and why the hell did they let you in here? Good to see you. <laughs> May I introduce Mademoiselle Anna Kassari? Constantinople is blessed by your beauty, Mademoiselle Kassarian. Nice to meet you. Please join us. Sir. I'm so happy we get to meet when I'm not teaching. Yes, what a surprise. Chris is a star reporter for the Associated Press. We met in Paris when my father was deputy consul. Well, his father was a spy. <laughs> That's why you were such a good drinking companion. You were looking to expose us. <laughs> a toast to old friends and you. Cheers. Christian Bale portrays an American journalist documenting the atrocities. Still, there is a love story. You read this script and you get to the end. How would you describe the story? Heartbreaking? How, how do you describe it? It's a heartbreaking story of survival. It uh, attempts to uh, show this, this uh, very human story uh, set inside a very tragic time, which is the Armenian genocide at the turn of the century, 1915, where 1.5 million Armenians perished. Yeah. But ultimately, it's very hopeful, isn't it, right? I mean, each displays great strength in, in, in the midst of adversity. This is described as one of the greatest and least known catastrophes of the 20th century. Any thoughts on why? You were getting the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire and the birth of um, uh, the Turkish nation. Um, there was great Turkish nationalism at that time. And then... Uh, the lack of consequences, and hence the lack of knowledge about it. Of course, the, the, it's uncomfortable to admit that the birth of a nation came from the pains of the extermination of an entire race. What's the ultimate promise in the promise? Well, there's a promise that uh, the character of Mikhail has towards um, the, the, the woman he's betrothed to, that he will return. Um, but I think overall there's a promise that um, never to forget by the, by the filmmakers, by Armenians in general, by anybody who has lost somebody. And one of the great things about this film is that 100% of the proceeds of the film uh, go to charity. It goes to uh, charities for human rights, uh, for uh, uh, anti-genocide movements, uh, injustices, and, and uh, making sure that it doesn't happen again. Coming up, could you stay up for 48 hours worshiping God? Well, we'll take you to the nation where entire churches did just that, right after this. Years ago, my father had a great revelation. If Jesus was God, then everything he said was a law of the universe. And it applies to everybody. It applies to Christians. It applies to non-Christians. These spiritual laws were the foundation of his best-selling book, The Secret Kingdom. In Pat Robertson's The Secret Kingdom, you'll learn how God's kingdom works, the principles that produce exceptional growth and development, the keys that build success in finances, health, relationships, and much more. We have compiled those teachings on this DVD for you as well as my teaching called The Law of Expectation, which was inspired by the laws of the secret kingdom. What you expect the future to be, you can cause it to be just merely by the fact that you believe it. Now for the first time in one DVD, The Secret Kingdom and The Law of Expectation. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it. I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. And welcome back to Christian World News. Just two weeks ago, Christians around the world celebrated Easter. Well, in Taiwan, the celebration was extra special. For the first time ever, 
Christians from across the country, across several uh, cities, came together for one purpose, introducing the Taiwanese people to Jesus. Meng Fei Li details the details, brings us the details rather. Nothing could stop them from singing and celebrating over Easter weekend. Taiwanese were fired up for Jesus. Church leaders in Taiwan invited Christians from around the country to join the most important occasion. This nation needs God. Each one of us needs to know God and follow Him. Only in Jesus will Taiwan become a better country. This year's Easter gathering was the largest for Taiwanese Christians in the past 40 years. For 48 hours, Christians of various ages prayed and sang together without sleeping. They passionately praised God and thanked Him for what He has done for the nation. Church leaders believe God is about to do something big. Taiwan is experiencing some unprecedented changes right now. God is in control of Taiwan. We need to work harder to wake up each Taiwanese to tell them about Jesus. This nation needs prayers, and we will not stop praying for this nation. Some of the church leaders urged the Christians to pray for some controversial issues, like legalizing gay marriage and education policy reform. They want Taiwan's leaders to understand only God can provide the country with the best future. Our government leaders need to know Jesus and pray for the unity of the nation. Taiwan is like a fountain. Once it's broken into pieces, the water will start to leak. We need to make sure our nation provides a solid foundation to receive the blessings and guidance of Jesus. Christians in Taiwan will continue to make their voices heard planning bigger events. They are praying that someday their government leaders will also come to join the family of Jesus. The pastor reminded us the meaning of purity. As Christ followers, it's important for us to stay pure for Jesus. He has a pure heart, and we can all do this. That's fantastic. In the past few weeks, by the way, you may have noticed that we have a new correspondent covering the Asia Beat, and it's expanding our reach. We've started a new Facebook page exclusively for Mandarin-speaking people. Meng Fei Li is here to tell us all about this exciting new development, uh, a page specifically for Mandarin-speaking people. Why? Well, George, as you know, Chinese people are actually living everywhere today in the world. And the reason why we want to start the page, the biggest goal is to share what Christ is doing all around the world. And we let people understand that God is working mm -hmm. in many nations and also in our lives. That's why we did design this page for this purpose. Uh, uh, by the way, you know, in, in China, where you are from, Right. Can you watch, can you see access Facebook page there? Well, right now the issue with China is not mainland China. It's mainland China because the firewall and because all the challenges. But outside China, yeah. for example, in many other countries or cities that like Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, even in the uh, United States, we have a large number of Chinese population. So that's why we keep the content 100% in Chinese yeah. so they will understand it. And also you will see a lot of stories that you never seen, or probably you would never seen other major networks, as you know. Uh, can you give us a, a, a sort of a taste of, of what people can expect when they go to the Facebook page? Oh, absolutely. So every day, and we have a brand new uh, stories related to family issues, okay. related to education, and also most importantly about the world issues. Okay. And also we have a lot of um, images and pictures that you can share with your friends, 100% in Chinese with the scriptures on it, so they understand what God is doing in our lives. Okay, terrific. And as Annie mentioned, you can uh, go and see these great reports uh, as well as his uh, coverage here on Christian World News. We encourage you to check it out. Thank you so much, Mang Absolutely. Okay, folks, up next, prayer in the White House. We'll show you how the highest officials in our U.S. government are seeking God for wisdom. These are principles for the whole world, just like the law of gravity and so also with the principles of the kingdom of God. The kingdom has everything we want. It has healing, financial blessing, marital bliss, success in what we do, and more than anything, it has access to God himself. How do we get there? Get the secret kingdom and the law of expectation, available now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. 
Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Welcome back to Christian World News. Here in America, members of President Trump's cabinet are meeting weekly for a Bible study. The vice president and eight administration officials, including Attorney General Jeff Sessions, sponsor the meetings. They're led by the founder of Capital Ministries, Ralph Drollinger. He says when a country's leaders seek God, it puts the nation in a position to be blessed beyond all that we can ask or think. Leaders of the Bible study say President Trump is always welcome to join. St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. has been a place of worship for every U.S. commander-in-chief for 200 years, including President Trump. CBN reporter Ben Kennedy takes us to the Church of the Presidents. Sitting across the street from the White House. St. John's Episcopal Church has served each commander-in-chief since James Madison, the nation's fourth president. Built in 1816, its proximity proved to be a dilemma for church leaders. They said, what are we going to do to accommodate the President of the United States if he wants to attend a service? The solution? Pew 54, which for 200 years has become known as the President's Pew. People would come early to try to sit close by so they could shake the hand of the President when they passed the peace during the service. And that got to be kind of funny and the rector often tells a story about how the church would slightly tilt to the left because everybody was sitting on the left hand side when they thought the President was going to attend a service. When the President's not in town, turns out anyone can sit in this pew. But odds are when the Commander in Chief shows up, Secret Service might kick you out. I can tell you this pew is never vacant. <laughs> even at the earliest of the services. To top that, an 18th century prayer book is put in the pew when the commander in chief attends service. That prayer book now contains signatures from past presidents. Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, George Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. Also, he did sign. Yeah. But not every president took advantage of their reserve space. He would sit in the very last pew on the back door. That man is the nation's 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. He would come in quietly, sit in the back pew by himself, and contemplate, pray, do what he had to do to deal with the burdens of the Civil War. And just before the service would end, he would quietly walk out that back door. The doors remain open at St. John's, both as a parish and as a piece of history in the heart of Washington, D.C. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Terrific. When we come back, the secret behind longevity of the world's oldest woman. Stay with us. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, 
discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey, kids. Do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're going to love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. And finally on our show this week, Violet Moss Brown of Jamaica is the oldest living person in the world. And as Charlene Aaron reports, she says the secret to her longevity is her Christian faith. At 117, Violet Moss Brown has been declared the world's oldest living person, something she says she never expected. No, I didn't know that I would become the oldest. I feel that I would be part of a long time ago. But thank God for whatever he has given to me. This is what God has given to me, so I have to take it long time. Affectionately known as Aunt V, Brown was born March 10, 1900. She says she attended church for most of her life and credits serving the Lord for her long life. I've done nearly everything in the church. I spent all my time in the church from a child right up. And when it comes to food, this super centenarian says she eats just about anything, with a few exceptions. Anything I've done, wipe my belly full. <laughs> <laughs> I don't eat pork, and I don't eat chicken, but I eat any other thing. Green, mutton, beef, fish. That's what I like. Meanwhile, Brown's eldest son is 97 years old, which could make him the oldest living person in the world with a parent also alive. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Aunt V, that is some inspirational message there. Happy belated birthday to you. Well, folks, that is it for this week's edition of Christian World News. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. I hope you've been blessed by our program. Until next week, from all of us, goodbye and God bless you.